Can you walk us through what it looks like to work with Guardian Gifts? Is it you have individual clients that you're giving them some structure to capture all of this and they like do the families find out after? What does that look like? Can you go a little deeper? I can. It's uh, There's three different levels of it. And there's an online do-it-yourself version where people, when they go into the program, they actually, um, the forms pop up and they're fill in the blank. It's very easy, very simple, and it's guided. It, I say to them, here's what you do first. And you fill in the blanks. It says, where were you born? Where were you living? Tell me who your parents were, their maiden name, your mother's maiden name. And then it, I suggest to people, get a copy of your birth certificate. Now, we, I suggest that they not use the original because they want to keep that in a safe place. But a copy and actually write on it copy and put it in a book. And if they from when they sign up for the program, I will send them a notebook and some other items that will help get them through the process. But every step is is guided in the do it yourself version. In the middle version, there's another version that people can sign up for. And we have curation guides. So they make an appointment with someone. It's virtual. And I have some trained people that will actually guide them through the process. Because sometimes a lot of clients will say, I don't know if this is appropriate. I don't know what I should do with um, the wardrobe or the bureau or the desk or this piece of the jewelry. And they'll, they'll want to talk it out. And so the guides are trained to listen, to ask appropriate questions, and to guide them through the entire process. And then there is a a top-tier version where clients can actually work with me directly one-on-one, and I will walk them through. And that's more of a therapeutic process because I actually get involved with families. I work with families to help them Uh, counter the end-of-life squabbles that brothers and sisters and cousins and all can have. And we work through all of that up front so that that is not an issue on the back end. So there is a huge therapeutic component that goes with what I do when someone works with me one-on-one. I I actually wrote that down about the family. So you're working... You're working with people before they're deceased versus the families afterwards. I actually will work with the family afterwards as well. Now, what that looks like is when we work through the process, there's a point in time where you get to where you currently are in life. You start out telling stories from when you were growing up, your first love, your first marriage, your divorce, your first car, whatever. We talk about all that. But then we get to where you currently are in life. And then we pivot and we look to the rest of your life. And then I start asking questions about, well, what does it look like or how are you going to pay for it when you get to a place where you may need some extra help or you may decide that you need to go into assisted living or even, God forbid, like my dad, you should have dementia and you end up in a nursing home. How are you going to pay for that? Then we start talking about your finances. So hopefully by the time that people work through the first part of the process, we've developed a level of trust where they're able to discuss that in an open way so that they can be open enough to hear the questions I ask. Because nursing homes are very, very expensive. They're anywhere from $6,000 on the low end to like ten dollars to $12,000. And this is a month. I'm talking per month. That is two or three or four times the mortgage that people, young people pay for. So we work through not only their finances, but I look at their will. I look at their uh, legal documents and we go over those. A lot of people haven't upgraded their will in a long time. I had a lady come that I worked with and I asked her about her will. She said, well, I don't have one. And I'm like, well, we need to get you a will. And she said, well, I did have one once upon a time. I said, well, if you had one, that means you still have one. And she looked at me real funny. I said, who is the executor of your will that you had? She said, it was my ex-husband. I said, well, I wonder how your 
current husband would enjoy your ex-husband being the executor of your estate. So people forget that they need to upgrade or update these things. So I walk them through that. I talk to them about what kind of insurance they have or not. And then finally, we get to a place where we talk about their funeral. We talk about their death. We talk about their spirituality. Whether they are a believer or not matters not to me. It matters to them. And what does that look like? And so I work with them around what kind of end of life service they'd like to have, what that will be, and how that will take place. And I've actually preached some funerals for clients. I have clients that say to me, I don't have a church. I don't have a pastor. I'm not interested in church or a pastor. But through this process, I've learned that I would like for you to preach my funeral. So, yeah, I've done more funerals than than anything else. But it's a holy moment for me. That's beautiful. I The other story, I, was, I have so many questions and I love digging deep into this. I don't know if it's just the context of this year. So many things have happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I just think that, well, I'm going to be selfish and ask you a question because I need to learn something in a little bit. But okay. my first question that isn't as selfish and maybe the whole audience can benefit from is what if you have the parents or the people that don't want to address it, right? So I'll make it a hypothetical because in in my case, it really wouldn't be true. But like, let's say there's multiple children Mm -hmm. and mom doesn't want to talk about what her wishes are. And I can foresee me and the siblings fighting over it or, you know, like there's always this, sometimes you don't know about it. It seems like you don't find out until after a person passes how evil people can be which I think is very disappointing. So I love that you're promoting the planning and the, and the strategic stuff. But what if you're dealing with someone that doesn't want to talk about it, that doesn't, like, you know, you're going to be the survivor. Odds are, how do you get, how do you get them to have that conversation and to get movement on this? Well, first of all, uh, let me just say, nobody wants to talk about it. People don't want to talk about death and dying mostly because people are superstitious and they think if I talk about it, especially as we get older, it's going to happen. But if one thing we've learned from COVID, sadly, is that we need to talk about it because we don't know when it's going to happen. And we didn't know before COVID when it was going to happen. But now more than ever, um, people need to realize, and they do, I think, how fragile life is and how quickly Somebody can be here today and gone tomorrow. But as far as addressing conversations with family members, um, as a therapist and as a pastor, it's quite easy for me to talk to people and people to talk to me. So I have a way, um, just, I guess, just who I am. Maybe it's this Southern charm. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, that's a joke. That's a joke. Um, Bless your heart. Bless my heart. People will tell me things that they will not tell their their family members. So it's um, if you don't have if you don't have a pastor or somebody that you know that you could bring in to help you with that, it's best to try to address situations, uh, difficult conversations. I call them something as simple as you know you, the car keys, giving up the car keys, or having the conversation about the end of life plans. You kind of make an appointment and you say, this is something I'd like to talk about. And you start, always start the conversation with I. I feel this is important. I feel, and you don't, because if you do the I feel statement, then you're not, you're not pointing a finger at the other person. Now, it may take more than one time, more than one try to get the senior adult, the parent to talk about something Because senior adults typically are like, I always told my senior adults when I was at the church, they were like overgrown teenagers, but they had money and they had power and they could say no where a teenager can't say no. Teenager has to do what you tell them, right? But for the most part, they're, and I told all of them this, you know, you're like big teenagers with money. And if I say, let's go do this and you got, no, we're going over here. I'm like, okay, I have to go over there with them. Um, but it, the funny part is that if you 
are persistent in a gentle way, eventually you will start getting bits and pieces of the conversation. Keep it focused. Keep it stay on one topic and one topic only. Don't bring up money right away. You know, don't make them think you're after their money. That's that's a typical thought. Uh, the other thing is just a story. I know um, I was working with a man who had stage four cancer. And after the conversations he and I had, his, his wife and I sat down with his book after he passed. And she said, you know, you learned more about him in a couple of months. She said, I've been married to him for over 30 years. And there are things that I did not know that you told me about. And all of the things that I learned, I put into the book. But then his children had access to those things too. And it went a long way to healing the family because there was some rifts there. But we started the healing process before he passed and working together and having conversations, keep them short, keep them focused, stay on one topic. Don't talk about money first thing. Don't talk about taking away the car keys or moving them into nursing home right away. Start the conversation now. Tell me the stories. Go ahead and start with the stories, just like I do in the Guardian's Gift. Wow. I'm sitting here thinking, what a beautiful, my show isn't, this show isn't going to launch until the new year, but as we're approaching Christmas, I'm thinking this is like a really cool gift. It is a gift. Your services are a gift that are appropriate, especially for the person who has everything, right? Like, I, I love. 